Good afternoon and welcome to the GSA Town Hall on the report A Vision for NSF Earth Sciences 2020 to 2030, Earth in Time, which was released in May. For those of you not familiar with the U.S. National Academies of Sciences, Engineering, and Medicine, we are a private nonprofit institution that provides independent, objective analysis and advice to the U.S. to solve complex problems and to inform public policy decisions related to science. A few reminders for the audience. For today's town hall, we will provide a short presentation on the Earth and Time Report, which will be followed by comments on relevant activities from some of our GSA division leaders. After that, we'll open it up for discussion amongst all participants. We welcome your comments. Please use the raise hand feature for comments so that we can call on you and ask you to unmute. We can also put comments or questions into the chat. We will be monitoring that as well. Before we begin, I'd like to introduce a few terms we'll be using. NSF is the National Science Foundation. GEO is the Directorate for Geosciences, one of seven directorates within NSF. There are four divisions within the GEO Directorate, covering ocean sciences, atmospheric and geospace sciences, polar programs, and the focus of this committee, Earth Sciences, EAR. EAR asked the National Academies to develop a vision for Earth Sciences in the coming decade. The committee organized by the academies was charged with three tasks. First, to identify a concise set of high priority science questions to advance earth science research. Second, to assess earth science infrastructure, including current infrastructure and future needs. Third, to discuss partnerships with other agencies within and beyond NSF that could maximize EAR's ability to address the priority questions. In addition, the academies convened a workshop to address future management models for geodetic and seismological capabilities. For each requested study, committee members are chosen for their expertise, and they serve pro bono to carry out the study's statement of task. The report that results from the study represents the consensus view of the committee and must undergo external peer review before it is released, as did this report. The committee reflected a breadth of expertise in earth sciences, including physical, chemical, and biological perspectives, focus on the earth's interior, surface processes, and climate, and laboratory, computational, and field-based approaches. George Garrels and Donna Whitney will present the report findings today. Others, such as our Chair Jim Yoder and many other committee members who have joined the meeting, are happy to participate in the open discussion after the GSA representatives. I'll pass it to Donna to discuss more about the report. So in the report, we highlight the fact that uh, Earth is a system, of course, and that there are many important uh, processes that cross what it, NSF or an EAR could be administrative boundaries. And it's really important that EAR continue its important work of, of enhancing research as an integrated system so that administrative barriers uh, don't get in the way of important research that uh, crosses these boundaries. Uh, we also, in the report, uh, really highlight the urgency of this moment and for the foreseeable future. We, we call it an all hands on deck moment to also emphasize the fact that, that we need everybody. We need diverse, inclusive groups working in many different ways that optimize creativity and, and impact of the research and education. And that, of course, this is inextricably uh, related to the infrastructure that we use and the methods that we use. And so all, all of this needs to be considered in terms of who's an earth scientist, you know, how do we do earth science and, and what do we need in, in the decade to come? So on the next slide, we have uh, an introduction that will lead to the, the science priority questions that you saw as our, part of our statement of task. And so the integrating themes of, of these priorities that we identify in the report uh, relate to Earth as a system, the, the interconnectedness of, of deep and shallow, of, of deep time and the present and thinking about the future, all the technological advances that we need in terms of, of measurements and, and modeling and, and all that goes along with that in terms of, of data. And, you know, Earth sciences in terms of EAR, a lot of it is fundamental Earth science research, basic research, but there, there's societal relevance to, to much of what we do. And so again, that, that relates to the urgency uh, of this moment. Uh, we highlight also that the, the key insights will come from strong disciplinary research programs, 
And, you know, we're about to look at the 12 questions that we came up with, but a really important point is that, that these are just representative, that there will be unanticipated discoveries that, that may be you know, incredibly important to what we do in the next decade. So in the next slide, we have our, our 12 questions. That was part of our um, result of our statement of task. And, and note that we were asked to come up with questions, not, not just themes as in previous decadal surveys. And so we, these are organized, as you can see from uh, the core to the clouds with examples from uh, many different aspects of the earth systems and, and highlighting some, some of the key questions that we think need uh, further study and are poised for transformation in the next decade. And, and I don't know if you've looked at these yet, but of course, some of them look deceptively simple. You know, what is an earthquake? But I hope that yeah, you'll see that some of these really uh, you know, are interesting in terms of what they imply about what we've learned in the last decade or so and what we're poised to do in the next decade. And so these are, are quite diverse questions that uh, touch many of us in the earth sciences. And I hope, uh, we hope as a committee that will lead to a lot of discussion and creativity in, in the coming decade. Now, George Garrels will present the rest. Okay, so thank you very much. So we addressed the facilities and infrastructure component of the report, pretty much following the task. Recall we had three uh, task components. We were to identify the needed infrastructure to, that's uh, needed to address the science questions. And we did that within the science questions. And then we are asked to evaluate the existing infrastructure that's supported by EAR, and then to analyze the capability gaps, what uh, future infrastructure would be needed to address the science priority questions. So we found that we were able to do a, a good job of describing the infrastructure that exists, the different facilities and the whole portfolio of infrastructure, but we found it difficult to evaluate the effectiveness of, of, the, of the infrastructure, especially kind of top-down broader view, how effective is the infrastructure in, in being able to address the science priority questions. And so we offered this as one of our first recommendations, which is that EAR supported facilities and the entire portfolio of EAR supported infrastructure should be regularly evaluated using stated criteria. And this would be helpful to prioritize future investments to perhaps sunset facilities as needed and to adapt to changing science priorities. So next slide, please. And so these are the, the recommendations that we have come up with in the report. And we should point out two different things before jumping into these. One is that all of these recommendations, these initiatives come from white papers, from community workshops and reports that have been assembled mainly during the past decade. And that we, we list these uh, recommendations, not so much in terms of priority or importance, not, not at all. What we're trying to do is just show the degree to which the community or the initiative is, is ready to go. And so our top left ones there, those three, we would view those as being shovel ready. These would include uh, NSF support for a national consortium for geochronology, a very large multi-anvil press community facility and a near surface geophysics center. We also suggest that EAR should support continued community development of the SZ4D initiative. And then moving down the list, EAR should encourage the community to explore a continental critical zone initiative and a continental scientific drilling initiative. And then EAR should facilitate a community working group to develop mechanisms for archiving and curation of currently existing and future physical samples and for funding such efforts. And this last one is one that we heard a lot about on the community input survey as being a critical need within many earth science departments in the country, just unable to to handle uh, the need to do this. And the next slide, please. We offer uh, two recommendations with respect to cyber infrastructure. And we also received a lot of community input about the need uh, for EAR to address these uh, possibilities. So EAR should initiate, initiate a community-based standing committee to advise EAR regarding cyber infrastructure needs and advances and EAR should develop and implement a strategy to provide for fair practices within community-based data efforts. And the next slide, please. 
And then we also, perhaps slightly different from has, what has been done in the past, we, we, we view human infrastructure as an essential component for what it takes to do cutting edge uh, earth science research. And we offer these two recommendations that EAR should commit to long-term funding that develops and sustains technical staff capability, stability, and competitiveness. And this is one we also heard a lot about in the community input survey. And at the bottom, but by no means um, lower priority. In fact, this is one that really threads through all of our all of our science questions, recommendations, and partnerships is that EAR should enhance its existing efforts to provide leadership, investment, and centralized guidance to improve diversity, equity, and inclusion within the earth science community. Okay, and some final thoughts is to mention again that uh, we, we consider the EAR's mission is, is more critical than ever. It's a very urgent time in earth sciences. And that the priority questions that we, we pr propose based on a lot on community input, uh, we think illustrate the significance, breadth and magnitude of the challenges and opportunities for research from 2020 to 2030. And that implementing these recommendations, including the infrastructure recommendations that George just mentioned, uh, isn't just about a commitment of funding, though, of course, that's very important, but really thinking about how we do things. And again, this gets back to the question of who's an earth scientist, what is an earth scientist, and so on. So EAR already does, is a leader in many ways in investigating the earth as a system with the interconnectedness of different spheres. Uh, and we think it's, we're in a really good position to poise the next decade of innovative research. And we hope that this report will, will help guide conversations about, about what to do next. And the next slide. So we've invited uh, representatives from GSA divisions to, to talk briefly, two minutes each, about how their division activities might connect to some of the themes of the report. And, and we hope that this will help lead into a broader discussion uh, and so we appreciate the time uh, for these uh, representatives of these divisions and we thank them in advance for, for what they're about to contribute. We'll just start with uh, Jim Russell from the Continental Drilling Division. Um, <clears throat> hello, uh, thanks for asking us to do this and for organizing it. And um, thanks to all of the committee members for all the efforts in putting that document together. It was really, uh, uh, energizing to read it in many ways. So uh, the, the Continental Scientific Drilling Division is a, is a relatively new division. We've, we're in our third year as a division now. And what we do is try to provide an intellectual hub for uh, scientists who are uh, exploring the Earth's continental crust. Uh, continental Scientific Drilling is really more of a tool than a science, but that tool promotes a really, really diverse array of uh, observations and uh, ways to answer uh, a really diverse set of questions. So commonly scientific drilling projects investigate the Earth's climatic, biological, and biogeochemical evolution. We, uh, we promote science investigating subsurface life and chemical cycles, volcanic processes, earthquake processes. So, so a lot of the questions that are really um, uh, you know, really well expressed in the in the Earth and Time report uh, are things that are promoted by by uh, drilling. Um, so what we do, we try to provide opportunities for uh, sessions, networking events. We we have distinguished lectureships. We uh, we fund student research projects on these topics. Um, Obviously, an area we'd like to see follow up on is this recommendation that EAR should encourage the community to explore a CSD initiative. Uh, we've had a number of meetings over probably the last decade about what such an initiative might might look like. Um, and uh, over the summer, we organized another workshop and now some members of the division as well as people uh, outside the division uh, have organized a sort of a task force to, to kind of think about uh, what that objective and initiative might might look like. So that's sort of where we are and what we're doing.
Great, thank you. While we're waiting for Donna to unmute, maybe I'll, um... there we go, Donna. There. Oh, sorry. <laughs> um, yeah, I, I think we'll just go to the next one though, right? And we'll, we'll have the different reports and then, and then discuss. So the, here's uh, Juliet Kreider from uh, GSA Structural Geology and Tectonics Division. Greetings, thanks everybody. And thanks for the invitation to participate in this panel. I'm Juliet Kreider and I represent the Structural Geology and Tectonics Division of GSA. And um, we, our organization is celebrating our 40th anniversary this year. And uh, I, I say uh, our members are engaged in almost all of the priority research questions listed in this document. So we uh, represent a, a diverse uh, uh, selection of research interests in this. And I think the, the most important thing I'd like to say today is that the uh, facilities, instrumentation, and infrastructure investments are really essential to keep our science moving forward. So some of the things that we're doing at this meeting include a um, linked a series of linked disciplinary sessions today and tomorrow on the uh, SC4D community initiative, um, building a vision and a plan for investigating subduction zones in space and time, uh, followed the, uh, at the end of uh, tomorrow by a town hall meeting in which we will uh, solicit community input. And important uh, earth and time themes uh, uh, in this effort include uh, cross-geo partnerships with oceans and atmosphere um, as we're looking at crossing the land sea boundary, the solid earth and the atmosphere boundaries to, to um, understand the evolution of subduction zones. We'll need geochronology, topography, material characterization, geophysics, and data management tools to be successful in this endeavor. Another community initiative that's come out this year is uh, the rapid uh, response to pandemic and restrictions in terms of conducting uh, traditional field geology instruction online. Um, there was a tremendous need and a tremendous community effort of the last six months to make this possible. And the results of that effort can be seen in sessions yesterday and today uh, ab about how that problem was solved. Important Earth and Times themes here are cyber infrastructure, um, but also very importantly, human infrastructure and uh, equity and inclusion in, uh, in field geology training. We have nearly 90 technical sessions and other events at GSA this year. And our priorities in general are supporting the breadth and diversity of structural geology and tectonics research, but also increasing the diversity of structural geology and tectonics researchers. So a few things we'd um, like to see, uh, have a conversation about and follow up is uh, ensuring that there is continued access to these major national facilities by individual PIs and students, and maybe thinking about how to lower the barriers to access for those to those research facilities. We like the EarthScope Ages model where individual students could apply for a small amount of funds to work um, at a different institution at a, at a uh, geochronology lab. We also think that continued training and professional development for researchers at all career stages is important to enable us to make the most rapid advances possible. Um, so that would be something interesting to talk for us to talk about. And finally, um, the tectonic community uh, put a big effort into a major uh, planning and visioning document just a few years ago, that should say 2018. And um, we're still uh, synthesizing and digesting uh, the CORS report, but uh, it'd be interesting to talk about how uh, this uh, new report maps onto the priorities that our community has established. Thank you. Oh, thank you, Juliet. That very thoughtful uh, analysis and information. So now we'll hear from uh, Jason Polk, the chair of the CARS division. Hi, everyone. I'm Jason Polk, chair of the CARS division, as, as she just mentioned, and I appreciate the opportunity to talk to you a little bit about our division and what we're doing. Uh, we're a fairly new division. Uh, we've really been only around since 
2014 and have continued to grow and evolve. And it was really exciting to see the report and to, to identify some of the areas in which we really are, are moving as a science and as a discipline and able to contribute and interact more. Um, really, at the top of the corner, I kind of just highlighted uh, because there were so many different areas, that it looks like more than half the, the questions posed in there, uh, in the report we easily can fit into and possibly more for sure. But just to highlight some of the, the things, uh, we're having a new frontiers session. This, this conference that actually has highlighted a few of these is really initiatives and priorities that overlap well with the report and some of the, the priorities uh, that are moving forward. So for those right now, I, I highlighted a couple uh, critical zone processes. Right now we actually have a, an NSF funded carbonate critical zone project through a, a couple of folks in the division. It's a five-year project that's uh, basically to create a cooperation network for this, this carbonate critical zone effort uh, to look at groundwater surface water interactions, geomicrobial processes, monitoring, resource management, et cetera, um, in these landscapes. So really for our division, anything with caves, groundwater, uh, sinkholes, those types of landscape features are really the, the primary aspects. So the critical zone component really fits a lot of the, the work that we do from the subsurface to the surface. Um, a couple other areas, the biogeochemical cycling and geological processes affecting biodiversity. Another big area outside of the, the physical geologic aspects uh, that we have, we also do a lot in the interdisciplinary realm of things related to, to biogeochemistry, biodiversity, things like pathogens research, everything from harmful aspects like coronavirus, potentially from bats in caves and spreading out uh, to humans, but also helpful things uh, like antibiotics and looking into microbial communities, uh, endemic species and evolution, and even planetary karst investigations that, that sort of fit into that realm uh, and, and uh, lots of others as well. So really see some interesting overlapping efforts in that area. The third one is hydrologic cycle under a changing climate. Uh, we obviously, again, focusing a lot on groundwater and, and major aquifers that, that are useful for, for groundwater withdrawal for many different types of communities and populations around the world. That's a huge piece of what we look at, both from a quantity and a quality aspect. Everything from drought and flood impacts on these aquifers to access and availability of water. And especially as we see a change in climate, some of the areas that we know are most vulnerable will be the ones that, that are in karst regions where we will see those impacts be exacerbated on, on those communities. Earth's dynamic climate uh, is, is a, another one that fits in well with a lot of, of up and coming work that's being done using uh, cave deposits to reconstruct climate. This has come a long way in the last few decades using uh, mineral formations and sediments in caves to go back and reconstruct climate at a high resolution for, for decades to centuries to millennia um, and how that impacts everything from groundwater availability, tying back to the hydrologic cycle, um, to predicting things like hurricane cyclicity and other work that's being done. So that's become a really established cornerstone of, of our discipline and our field and some, some great presentations on how that's advancing. And then the geohazards reduction is another one that kind of overlaps with, with some of the, the more physical hazards aspects of our discipline. So sinkholes and the occurrence of those under a changing climate, under, under some of the, the recent changes we've seen in the hydrologic cycle, um, groundwater contamination and monitoring and tracking as we see those become more prevalent when we have increased flooding and just population growth and change. Um, so throughout all those, those different uh, initiatives, they certainly overlap a lot with division initiatives and things that we see as priorities for our discipline. On the other side for, for report aspects, we'd like to see follow-up. Um, some of the, the things that we see here in the report that work well with, with what we currently have as priorities, but also maybe some additional focus uh, would be ERA, ERA, EAR lab support for critical zone and water cycle processes. Um, we see a lot of, of efforts in areas that kind of overlap, but specifically in those, those two fields, there's a lot of need for instrumentation. Um, there's a lot of recent advancements in the last decade of, of instrumentation and in the way that we can actually conduct our research. So having more support infrastructure for those would be really helpful. The Near Surface Geophysics Center certainly fits well with uh, our need for better instrumentation and capabilities for mapping subsurface geologic hazards, um, flow path mapping, that sort of thing. So uh, that's an exciting initiative that certainly I can see benefit for our discipline. The Continental Critical Zone you know, overlaps well with, with the effort we already have underway for this project uh, from some of our colleagues. A huge portion of the ice-free land surface is karst, and so we actually are, are studying a pretty vast amount of the critical zone across multiple continents and in different areas. Uh, so certainly that initiative and support for that um, across all different areas would be useful. And then the Earth Archives, I thought was an interesting 
um, specifically for our discipline because we actually do have a lot of unarchived information. It, it's becoming better sorted and organized as the discipline grows. And that includes everything from newly discovered minerals and microbes um, to even just map surface, subsurface passages um, that, that are maybe not well archived or managed or available at a, a national level um, and trying to do larger scale work looking beyond just a local, local region or beyond the US. And the last two items are really just a, a sort of broader scopes uh, capabilities, things like big data. Uh, we're generating now very large data sets uh, related back to everything from paleoclimate archives to, to water, to any kind of hydrologic data, water quality, water quantity data, um, moving into modeling, um, using neural networks, machine learning. Um, so a lot of different data sets being, being generated um, and the ability to process and analyze these would be really useful as we move forward and, and some unique applications, specifically things like groundwater modeling, which is traditionally incredibly difficult in these types of environments that really does require sort of new and innovative techniques and, and the reliance on computing power and the, the ability to actually go through and, and process these large data sets in certain ways that are a little bit different than there may be other ways in other sciences. And the last one is just the great effort I see across this report and across the, the current initiative being put forth um, by NSF to be more interdisciplinary and collaborate within NSF directorates and outside into other, other areas of, of the government, other entities, because in our discipline, that's certainly a priority. Um, you can see through some of these listed priorities, we obviously connect together and work with lots of other disciplines from anthropology to biology to archeology span and beyond um, to really be able to conduct our research and, and bring it all together. So we'd like to see that. And with that, one of the, the key initiatives is improved communication and education. Uh, really a lot of leaps in the last few years and certainly efforts to, to improve diversity, inclusion, education and communication about all of the different priorities we have uh, that affect communities and people to help initiate new projects and, and help our science advance uh, certainly are all things that we'd appreciate support on and being able to contribute to uh, as we move forward. No, thank you. Yeah, that was very interesting with lots of uh, priorities and ideas. So next is Alan Rooney from the Geochronology Division. Um, thanks very much. Um, so yeah, my name is Alan Rooney um, and I'm the incoming chair uh, for the Geochronology Division. Um, along with uh, some of my uh, board members at the bottom of the slide, a number of them also on the call. Um, so we're a new division, um, Leah Morgan, Julie Fosdick, George Gerrows and myself uh, put this division together about three years ago. Um, we're up to over 500 members um, and our members, uh, they include both consumers as well as producers of geochronology data. Um, so these communities and research groups are, are targeting questions across high temperature, low temperature, um, short and very long time scales. And we look at questions concerned with the, the deep earth and all the way through to near surface processes. And so it's a, it's a very broad uh, research group. Um, and in the last year, um, we have a dedicated DEI coordinator, uh, Nicole Aitken, who came on the board and has made great strides um, in increasing diversity, equity and inclusion, um, starting initiatives with regards to these uh, points to sort of greater facilitate uh, accessibility and um, the geochronology and the geosciences or earth sciences. And this is at the, the GSA level as well as within the division level, something we're, we're very keen to push forward on. Um, and then at our town hall um, during this meeting, um, we started a, a conversation with our members um, and other, other groups with regards to a potential geochronology consortium, uh, which is, was recommended in the Earth and Time report. Um, and so we are starting to put the conversations together and, and starting workshops to try and understand the sort of directions um, and the structure and the questions that would go towards that geochronology consortium. Um, and so we feel that together, these three items uh, highlight a really strong commitment to all of the questions uh, outlined in the, in the report, as well as the, the sort of initiatives that are driving forward from today. Um, and we're particularly excited uh, to working towards enhancing community connections and that will help expand lab um, and technique accessibility. This is critical, um, we believe, in, in sort of establishing community connections that would help drive both technique development as well as education um, and equity in the geochronology as well as other components of the earth sciences. Um, and so, as I said, other board members are on the call and we're happy to take uh, any conversation, uh, questions and just want to say thank you very much for the opportunity to contribute here. Great. Thank you very much for that. Okay. Uh, now we'll hear from, I think, Julie Brigham Grete um, about quaternary geology and geomorphology. 
Yes, thanks a lot. And fat and thank you very much for a fabulous report. I want to edit my my slide here. Uh, first off, as that all 12 of the driving questions are really important within the division of of quaternary geology and geomorphology. And I'm here today as the incoming uh, president to the division and also on the call is Missy Epps, who is the outgoing president of the division. Um, I think one of the important things about all of the driving questions is that um, these driving questions cut across all, all aspects of the geosciences, but certainly within this um, quaternary division really lies at the interface of how humans interact with this landscape that we live on and how we use it, whether it's for agriculture, whether it's looking at sea level rise, um, all of the various aspects of how humans impact the earth and how we need to be more sustainable are really captured really across almost all 12 of these uh, aspects and involve the, the surface um, processes in geomorphology and the past history so that we can learn of how, whether it's in the deserts or when the, or in the Arctic, uh, we can learn about how these processes acted in the past and how they may be influenced by human activity. So I was thinking uh, we could almost take every single one of these 12 issues and, for example, um, what, what are the causes and consequences of topographic change and its impact on society. For example, looking at uh, um, glacial isostatic adjustments versus uh, dynamic topography brings together um, sea level history, coastal management, uh, coastal processes, even involving solid earth processes. So we cut across all of these various disciplines. And I think you could do, I could give you an example of that across all of the 12 elements that are shown here. So we also like the fact that a lot of the, uh, the ideas that are brought together are not only just discovery science, but what we would like to call actionable science. And this is where we bring um, what we can do to um, improve the human element uh, on our landscape and provide more sustainability. So in integrating actionable science that's policy relevant, it really comes out in the report, at least in my, my opinion. And I think, uh, those of us working on surface processes and paleoclimate would certainly um, uh, see that this is really relevant as the, we continue to warm up uh, the planet. The other relevant issues, uh, initiatives that are outlined in the report are all consistent with the, the needs and activities of the division. Uh, uh, whether it's critical zone, that's, that's where we are, the surficial geology. Continental drilling is important also for past climates and hazards. Um, and, and we also are really pushing also on this fair data idea. This is also important, whether it's uh, storing data and making it available, but also providing storage for samples and archiving. So these various facilities that store our materials are really important and need to be funded. Sustainable technical staff is really important. I think we lag behind other countries in uh, trying to maintain the technical staff that, that we have, that's becoming more challenging. And I, th I, the last point here is just maintaining an outward leaning collaborations with international partners. That was not quite as clear in the report. There's a lot of really good material about interacting across agencies and the federal government, but it's really important to do that. We just recently signed an agreement with the International Association of Geomorphologists to link with other countries um, and the other last thing I wanted to just comment on is we in the Quaternary Division are launching a, a very actionable set of changes we'd like to make in our division to increase um, what's called JEDI, the justice, equity, diversity, and inclusion across our division. And so we're going to implement real change in our bylaws to make sure that we can set an example for other uh, other divisions. So thank you very much. No, thank you. Um, and I think the, for the last one, we'll hear from uh, Reto Gare and Geology and Health Division. Hello, everyone, and thank you for the opportunity to speak here in this town hall. I'm representing the Geology and Health Division of the GSA. This is a fairly small division. 
And um, so we really welcome this report because it contains so much important information that is fundamental to our area. We are basing our research on the three overarching themes, but particularly active in the third one that uh, studies the influence on the human, um, human systems and human society. So we use the fundamental earth science research and look at the societal relevance. Um, we have primarily right now are trying to build our base by being active in organizing sessions at GSA. It's a young field, a very um, rapidly growing field. So to find out what are the implications of environmental contamination. And so what we do is go beyond documenting contaminants in the environment, um, being water, soil, or the air as well, and going beyond trying to figure out where these contaminants are coming from, but really looking at what are they doing to our bodies. And so that's our main activities. We had a short course at this GSA meeting that was uh, chaired by our, some of our members, um, generally on the Earth's impact on human health, and then some specific sessions. And you see from the different um, session topics that we really are interested in these contaminants and they, how they affect various parts of our body, but not just individually, but also in terms of the public. So public health is equally at the core of our research. If you think, for example, of lead pollution, um, this is a tremendous issue in many cities around the world and in many, particularly in the US. And it's not just the lead drinking water lines. We have a lot of pollution in the soils as well, in the atmosphere. And so it's the exposure is an issue, but also the health risk and what can we do about it? So we try to come up with policy um, recommendations that help reducing risks in all these different um, areas of research. And one session highlighted down there, T209, the dose makes the poison, a very old saying. This is really important. And we are looking at this issue by collaborating with medical doctors, medical researchers, because we are trying to do uh, to find out what are the consequences of increasing doses of certain chemicals in the environment. We need the help of organic chemists, so it's not just geologists that do that work, but in particular all the exposure experiments have to be done by medical professionals, so in the laboratory, in vitro, sometimes in vivo. Um, so we couldn't do that without the medical professionals. And finally, more general themes like environmental geochemistry and health and the global health, which is tightly connected to public health as well. So what we really would like to follow up is how can, um, how can we partner with other federal agencies? We are really at the, at the far end of the geosciences um, with one foot in the medical sciences. And it's hard to find not only journals to, to publish our research, but also get funding. The, on the medical side, there are some Im important programs. Perhaps you have heard of the Superfund Research Program in NIEHS. This is a tremendous opportunity where um, these, these proposals all need environmental um, projects in there, minimum two. So that's the way how we can tag into the medical sciences and, and get fairly large grants. So this is one of our top priorities. How can we partner with other federal agencies, in particular those that are dealing with medical issues? Thank you very much for putting this town hall together. And I'm excited to be here and answer any questions if you have any. Uh, thank you so much for that summary and discussion of priorities. Um, I just wanna thank all of the division representatives who, who gave talks. And I think between the report and all of what you presented, there's, there's lots to discuss. Um, I think I'll turn it over to Deb Glickson to manage the uh, discussion. Absolutely. And I, I echo those thanks. And I apologize for the hundreds of emails that you got in the last two weeks. Um, welcome to working on a committee with me. So um, I see we already have one question. So I'm going to mention that um, what will happen is that um, you'll get a little thing that asks you to unmute and, on, and or to turn on your video. So let's start with uh, Ross Henderson. So there might be a little delay. Can you, hi, can you hear me? Mm -hmm. Oh, sorry, I don't, yeah. Um, so I have a question, I guess, to all the NASM committee, and it has to do with distributed acoustic sensing, which I believe is a um, NSF program in, the, in their grand challenge, maybe in phase one. 
But okay, so this is a two part question. Is that part of EAR? And then I have a follow up. So it's it's about this uh, DAS DAS. Mm -hmm. I'm looking around to see if there are any hands from our or anybody from our committee wants to unmute. Um, maybe let's hear your second half of your question. How's that? Okay, so um, maybe Dr. Polk already answered this. Um, sorry, I'm trying to trying to do th two, several things. So maybe. Um, but my question is about aquaculture. So the um, GSA uh, karst division, I understand, is involved with hydraulics and underground uh, water aquifers and things like this and flow path mapping. However, it seems that it's directed only to underground earth water. So what about offshore or even... Uh, so not seismic, not geodesic, not really volcanic, but sea level, and this has to do with 3D DS, which is very, very relatively new. Because um, as you probably all know, DAS is a fiber base and it's shovel ready. So this is my follow up. Great. It has uh, Mike... to do with aqu aquaculture, sorry. All right, thank you. Um, so. Maybe we'll ask um, Jason. Do you want to see? Do you want to respond? Or Michael? I see a hand raised from Michael, and I know that this was directed towards Jason Polk. Sure, I'm happy to. I, I think I understand your question, although I'm not maybe sure I can answer it perfectly um, based on what I do know. But yeah, we, we do a lot of different work looking at subsurface water and mapping flow paths and different types of interactions that include coastal interactions, you know, including, you know, uh, springs that are underwater that, that may come out under under different areas, you know, in gulfs or bays or shores. And so there's a lot of different techniques there. There are everything from seismic techniques to more traditional, you know, underwater mapping using tracers and that sort of thing. Um, I, I don't know that we if user, there's a lot of work being done in the area that you're describing for, for what we actually use it for in our discipline right now. Um, but I certainly see there could be opportunities um, and potentially other things that are out there that people are working on that I'm just not familiar with. If any of my other okay. colleagues here can speak to it, feel free to, to jump in. I'm not sure. I think there's a few of them on here. So, yeah, so, so thank you very much. And, um, just as another follow-up uh, about with underground aquifers in the Great Lakes, are you in, are you looking at the Great Lakes besides just the continental? I think there may be some people doing some work on those, um, but it, it's most of our aquifer work is on specific types of aquifers that are, are obviously a little bit different. So, so porous media aquifers and those types of things are not settings that we typically are doing as much on in our discipline, even though we draw from that, from, from hydrogeology and that discipline uh, itself. So we're, we're doing obviously more conduit mapping and more turbulent flow mapping in aquifer settings and things for, for some of these larger regional aquifers. But we do have diffuse flow and, and other, other settings and it's, it's a little bit more complicated, I think, in how we maybe approach that. And then those types of settings, uh, as far as water underneath water, it's kind of what you're describing. So uh, yeah, yeah. yeah under, there's and then, under, things, so. Sorry. Okay, great. Underneath, I think I think we should stand. Sorry, and okay, the what, desert. Okay, underneath the desert too. Yeah. Why don't we move on to the next uh, question, or why don't we? Um, actually, I think Michael Foot has his hand raised, so why don't we um, go to him? Thank you. Yeah, I I guess uh, I'm not sure I fully understood the context of the question, but in terms of the report, rather than the breadth of what's going on in geoscience research. Um, there's a clear emphasis on all aspects of the hydrologic cycle. So I guess the simple answer to the initial question is, you know, yes, this is the, 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 the full spectrum of what water does on the planet from the mantle up to the upper atmosphere is something of interest. Great. Thank you. All right. I see. Um, oh, Shimin, do you want to respond to that? And if not, I have a comment from Jim Russell. Oops, Shimon, you muted yourself again. 
Okay. Yeah, I just want to quickly respond that um, I think uh, um, offshore surface is part of the water cycle that I think uh, we broadly talked about in the report. I think uh, it is definitely part of the larger picture of the water cycle, whether it's offshore or uh, on the continent. I don't think we, uh, when we particularly close to the uh, continent offshore coastal regions, and it's definitely very relevant to the understanding of the water cycle dynamics. Great, thank you. Um, we uh, question or comment from Jim Russell, and then I have a question from the chat. Yeah, hi. Um, I guess I was curious, just uh, from the perspective of the committee members, maybe uh, how best how best can we help to uh, kind of engage in and carry out some of the um, some of the activities and you know suggestions that are that are identified in the report. You know, we're, we're engaged in a lot of the scientific questions as well as, you know, in my case, some of the uh, suggestions for, you know, development of facilities and things. But I'm, I'm just kind of curious what, what you, you know, what you would recommend the kind of the next, the next steps in that engagement like, might look like, what the, you know, what the, yeah, how you envision the next, you know, a couple of years, I, I don't know. I, I hope, I'm not being very clear, but I, I, I hope you get the gist of the question. It's a good question. And I, there, it actually more committee members than I had expected. So I'm gonna to wait to see if anybody wants to either raise their hand or just jump right in and, and answer it. Oh, come on. Jim, um, Jim, you'll get a little button that's asked you to unmute. All right. Well, I think um, if I understood the question, NSF responds to proposals, so if you think you've got something to contribute to those themes, I, you know, some sort of proposal, whether it's for a workshop or a science pro program, would be the way to contribute. I, I, if I understood the question properly. Yeah, that that's the kind of thing I was I was wondering about. Sort of what you know, I, I don't know if divisions can write. Well, divisions cannot probably write proposals, but we can certainly write proposals as individuals yeah. to utilize the, the divisions to you know to kind of think about scoping and things like this for. Yeah, holding sessions that you're meetings is also a way that you're brought, you know, drawing attention to the issue, the issues. Great, um, looks like Kate and then Michael wanna join in on this one. Hi, thanks, thanks everyone for uh, this interesting discussion so far. Um, your question, uh, I think is a great one. And I was really impressed by how the division leaders here um, on ha have have sort of tried to tried to communicate how they envision themselves uh, and their constituencies fitting into the science priority questions, and it occurs to me that the that um, you know your groups are really uh, great places for community to engage and and you know come up with their own ideas of what resonates most with them and um, how they you know to, to make those asks and it doesn't need to be just only in science proposals um, it seems like NSF is asking for uh, comments and and um, engagement and so I think exactly what you're doing <laughs> it seems to me like like fantastic ways to engage and make the next steps forward and really take that leadership role your, your, our, ourselves yourselves um, in in seeing what what it is that the community wants. But um, I'm very inspired by the kinds of ways uh, that people have already articulated the connections they see in the ways they see themselves fitting into the priority questions and the infrastructure needs and um, so those conversations, the science sessions, and then, uh, you know, those sorts of things can then catalyze uh, activities with individual PIs that would then ask for funding um, or larger consortia to, to come up with working groups. And, uh, you know, those, oh, now I'm forgetting the name of them, but the, oh, you know what they're called, those, uh, those, uh, work, those uh, workshop things that, that they fund. <laughs> Anyway, sorry to end on an unarticulate note. <laughs> Thanks. That was great. Thanks, Kate. Um, and I have two questions from the chat, but I'm going to also just, I'm going to put in a disclaimer to these questions, which is, um, please remember that the committee members who wrote the report um, don't actually work for NSF, so they can't answer questions about what NSF 
is doing. Um, so I'll, I'll ask the questions, but I'm not sure what kind of response we might get. So um, one question from Corey Black Eagle is, he'd like to know what, or she, I'm sorry, I should say they, would like to know what efforts are underway to integrate the existing and completed uh, critical zone programs to the ongoing critical, continental critical zone initiative. Anybody want to tackle that one? So it's what efforts are underway to integrate the existing and completed critical zone programs to the ongoing uh, continental critical zone initiative. Oh, oh Michael's going to take a stab. Oh, I'm, I guess I would say, so first of, I mean, this is really a riff on what Deb just said about, you know, that we're not NSF. We are, we're, you know, we made our recommendations to NSF. The, the critical zone initiative has not been adopted by NSF. This was a recommendation from the committee. And so I think the simple answer is nothing has been done yet because we don't know if NSF is going to adopt that, uh, adopt that recommendation and do anything about it. Does that sound reasonable, Deb? I think that sounds reasonable to me. And I think, um, unfortunately, that, um, oh, I'm sorry, Corey, would you like to um, follow up? Let's see, can we unmute you? There we go. Just did that one, there we go. Uh, sure, I, my question is, I think that the critical zone is a crucial initiative and I applaud you for identifying it. Uh, I'm currently involved in the carbonate critical zone, um, RCN. I know that within the um, quaternary geology division, they were doing a, a um, critical zone, and I don't remember the, the name of it that has ended. And so I know there have been other critical zone programs out there. And so in the initiative, I think part of what needs to be done is to pull all of those together, as well as move forward with additional research. So it wasn't necessarily a, what are you gonna do about it so much as a, is there a way to think about pulling all that existing research together and moving forward with the Continental Critical Zone Initiative. <clears throat> I might suggest we leave that as an open question. Um, there are definitely some folks from the National Science Foundation who are listening on the line. So perhaps it's a, a good thing for them to hear how, unless anybody else wants to respond to that. Okay. Um, I have another question in the, the chat that again, is kind of the same flavor. So I just want to make everyone aware of that. So how does NSF encourage interdisciplinary scientists to serve on panels or as reviewers within non-interdisciplinary regular programs? Um, interdisciplinary work can be overlooked due to lack of familiarity with jargon and the concepts that don't translate. How would you make sure that you know that there's a mechanism? And I don't think anybody on the committee can really answer this question, um, but I might might throw it out there. And it's from Missy Epps. Andrea. <laughs> yeah, I can say just um, can you hear me right? Mm -hmm. From personal experience, uh, you know, oftentimes the proposal can be co-reviewed, and um, so you'll get it co-reviewed by another panel. And actually, we talked to NSF about inter interdisciplinary research some during the progress of writing this report. And I know there's a perception in the community that if, well, if you get it co-reviewed, then you have less of a chance of getting it funded because now you have more panels reviewing it. The feedback that we got from the program officers was that that is not borne out by the data that they have on proposals that are co-reviewed. So it does not hurt your proposal in that sense to identify the fact that it is interdisciplinary and it may need to be co-reviewed. And so, you know, that's basically to be encouraged was the message that we got. Very helpful. Um, so it's, um, it's five minutes till the end of the hour. Um, and I know that people will rush off to the next thing, but do we have any further questions or comments while we've got everyone on the line? A quiet group today. Um, 
then maybe what I will do is direct you towards the chat where our report is available for a pre free PDF download. Um, and we do have hard copies. Uh, if we could ever get back into our offices, we'd be happy to provide those to you as well. Um, and I wanted to thank all of our committee members um, again, and I would like to really thank our uh, GSA division representatives. That was incredibly helpful, um, very, very valuable. And I thank all of you for taking an hour out of your day during such a busy time to spend it with us. And I hope that you have gained something from it. If you have any questions, um, uh, I'm happy if my my email, um, I'll throw my email in the chat in just a second. And, um, and I'm happy to relay any questions or concerns to the committee members. Thank you so much. Have a great day.